My name is Walter Seawood Pierce. I'm going to tell you about my father, Stephen Seawood Pierce. We both have the same middle name, Seawood, and the name's been passed down the generations as a middle name. Father was born in the St Mary's area of Southampton in 1840. His father, also named Stephen Seawood Pierce, was a coal merchant. At 20, my father Stephen was a working carpenter. He married my mother, Emily, in 1862. My grandfather died in 1865 and left effects under £450. Father and his younger brother, James, inherited the family business and it became known as Pierce Brothers. The courts became a familiar territory for these brothers. In, in 1870, an anonymous letter was sent to one of the coal traders they dealt with, saying, Dear Sir, if you sell any coals to the firm of coal merchants known as Pierce Brothers, take no bill, but sell for prompt cash payment. When the Pierce boys saw the letter, they recognised the handwriting, so the accused withdrew the allegation and the court awarded the brothers 40 shillings. Now, father became a local councillor in Southampton in 1871 and stayed there until 1879. During this period, he became Sheriff of Southampton, the equivalent of the Deputy Mayor, and a member of the town's Peer and Harbour Board and Senior Bailiff. He also became High Chief Ranger of the Ancient Order of Foresters, as well as being an energetic member of both the Art Fellows and the Freemasons. By 1881, he had six daughters, as well as me, his only son. But by golly, did he have a temper. For example, in 1875, he was on the platform at a political meeting. He was charged with assaulting John Patstone, a gunmaker. He allegedly divested himself of his overcoat, leapt from the platform, and, seizing Mr. Patstone by the throat, turned him out of the room. Stephen said that the man had continued smoking, despite being asked by the chairman to stop. The justices at the court were split three apiece. Father got off. During the local election of 1878, Father and Uncle James were satirised in a political poster. They were called the Three Loving Frogs. Father was called the Lying Frog, and Uncle James was the Marching Frog. In 1880, Father's temper flared again when a small boy threw mud at him as he rolled along in his horse and trap. The little lad alleged that father got out of his carriage and beat him, allegedly a cripple, with a stick. They decided that Stephen had assaulted the boy and fined him 10 shillings. Now the next year, 1881, was a momentous one for father. He borrowed heavily to buy the Renishaw Colliery in North Derbyshire before he took over the mine, in a generous, and some might say foolhardy gesture, he gave the miners a day off with pay. He paid for a slap out meal for these workmen at a local hotel, the Sitwell Arms, whilst providing a sort of sports day in tea and a marquee for 300 of their wives and children in the adjacent field. The Derbyshire Times described the event thus, Large banners, union jacks, flags, festoons and mottos were hoisted on every conceivable spot about the colliery head gear, engine house, pit bank etc. and also in front of the Sitwell Arms. Within a year of this celebration however, the same local paper gave a very different report about the state of Renishaw Colliery and the state of my father's personal finances. The headline says it all. Failure of Mr. Stephen Seward Pierce of Southampton and London. It was agreed that my father and my uncle would go into liquidation rather than bankruptcy. So my poor father was penniless. An advert in the Hampshire Advertiser 
listed for sale. His superior household furniture and effects at his house, including capital walnut piano and oil paintings. My father, age 41, faced a bleak future with my mother and us children to support. By 1885, father was out of luck again. He applied for and obtained a position as resident manager at Fairham near Portsmouth for Mr. Fraser, a coal merchant. Father stood accused of, in court of forging a bill, a promise to pay, signing his new employer's name to the sum of 37 pound, five shillings and fruitance. The trader knew Mr. Fraser's signature and so the game was up. The trial took place at Hans Wilson Dorset Assizes, held in Winchester. Father said he believed he was forging these financial bills on behalf of his employer. The judge said that the offence is a most serious one in the eyes of the law. The sentence I am about to pass is the very lowest I can impose in the discharge of my duty, and that sentence is that you be kept in penal servitude for six years. Following his release from prison, father seemed to lead a life of crime. He stole antique coins from a lady in Yorkshire in 1891 and got six months hard labour. On release from prison in early 1892, he made his way back to his own town, Southampton. In 1894 he was addressing meetings as a potential candidate for the Independent Labour Party. But later that year, Father was back in court again for stealing and forging blank cheques and was given another three years in jail by the judge. And even on his release in 1896, whilst living in London, he broke the rules of his parole and so the police arrested him and took him up before the magistrates. In 1901, Father was an inmate in the South Stone and Workhouse near Southampton. In May that year, my poor mother, Emily, died aged 62. According to a doctor, she died of exhaustion. She'd been living with my youngest sister, Edith, we called her Queenie, who was then only 20, in the house of one of my elder sisters in Chiswick. I registered my mother's death and arranged her funeral. Eighteen months later, father was charged with begging from the Reverend Albert Boone in Piccadilly, in London's West End. He asked for one shilling and sixpence to pay for his lodgings and laundry. In court, father was called a plausible and cunning rogue. My poor father died on the 2nd of May 1906, just days before his 66th birthday. His body was found on the railway line between Millbrook and Redbridge in the Southampton area. He was identified by Uncle James, who said that he'd seen him last in January of that year. The headlines in the Southampton Independent said it all. Tragic death of ex-Sheriff of Southampton. The inquest heard that to access the railway in this way involved trespassing on private land. It also heard that father had mortal wounds, suggesting that he had been struck by a train's guard rail whilst moving along the track. Uncle James stated that there was nothing to suggest that his brother would take his own life. The jury concluded that he had died from injuries, having been struck by a train. Lives are full of little ironies. My uncle James named his eldest son Stephen Seward Pierce. By the time Stephen had reached the age of 24, he had shortened his name to Seward Pierce, and by that time he was a practicing solicitor to avoid having the same name as his notorious uncle. As Seward Pierce, this young man was later to be one of the top lawyers of his generation, decorated by the king and retiring as Deputy Public Prosecutor. My little sister, Edith, Queenie we called her, was just a baby 
when her father faced financial liquidation. At the age of 19, she is in this group photograph with me and the rest of our sisters. This is a later picture of me and my sisters in 1938 at a wedding. Our little Queenie later became a magistrate in the 1930s. None of us told our children or grandchildren about the dark side of our father's life until now that is. <laughs>